All right, so this should be good. Pop that on screen for now. So today we're going to be doing more extra history. It's been a little while since we've done anything React related on stream. I've been sort of killing time not doing that. And today we're going to be doing history of beer. This is actually a pretty recent series, if I am correct about such. Um, where does it say when it came out? <laughs> Pretty sure it's supposed to say hey, well it's a couple months ago uh so as far as the history of beer goes like that's the sort of mundane topic that i really want to go deep into <laughs> when it comes to like I, I love that stuff i you you tell me about a war and you'll put me to sleep but if you want to tell me about the origins of a very uh a very mundane beverage that people enjoy count me in yo that sounds like a great time so we're gonna be doing history of beer the first episode is called building a civilization uh i'm personally not a drinker i'm just gonna put that out there i don't know much about beer at all in general and i say i'm not much of a drinker i've never drank i i'm underselling it i've never drank in my life and uh yeah so i i am very ignorant on this stuff I, did, I, I don't know how beer was discovered. I assume it was by accident. I'd imagine wine probably came first, right? I assume they'll tell us. Uh, but I, I'd imagine you, you get wine and then later on you figure out beer. But that, that's just me throwing something out there to see if it's true or not. All right. Let's do it. Do you think you'll go back to Historia Civilis? One day, maybe, probably. I don't know. <laughs> uh... I go back to things I'll I, I, he's something I like to do rarely but I don't think I ever want to give up as long as I'm doing react stuff I, I would never like say I'm never going back to him you know like it, it's always on on the table Sumer 4,000 years ago the woman recites a hymn to the goddess Ninkasi as she works Ninkasi it is you who water the earth covered malt the noble dogs guard it even from the royals it is you who soak the malt in a jar. It is you who spread the cooked mash on large reed mats. It is you who holds with both hands the great sweet wort, brewing it with honey and wine. You place the fermenting vat, which makes a pleasant sound, appropriately, on top of a large collector vat. It is you who pour out the filtered beer of the collector vat. It is like the onrush of the Tigris and the Euphrates. Then she takes a sip. This is the first known recipe for beer. The drink that built. Wait, wine? Uh, this may sound stupid. You put wine to make. You use wine to make beer. I, I I'm just so I know. I believe I know that beer is wheat, and I think that's all I know. <laughs> so sh this this is gonna be a whole new world for me, guys. Built civilization. Thanks so much to World Anvil for helping us draft today's historical tale. Now, while you watch the five little books drop in our opening graphic, you may have thought to yourself, are they really going to spend a whole series on beer? I mean, is there really that much to say about it? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, Please oh, do. Yeah. yeah, there is. In fact, our biggest problem isn't going to be how to fill this series, but actually how much stuff we're going to have to leave out. Because the story of beer is that massive. From its origins of being brewed in Neolithic baskets, it rose to an industrialized beverage shipped around the world, facilitating many historical events along the way. From helping the British take over India to the establishment of food quality laws. Not to mention, pubs and beer halls have been the headquarters of many revolutions. From the Green Dragon Tavern of the South oh, yeah. to Hitler's Beer Hall Putsch. Beer's story is a global one. No one person or culture invented it. In fact, beer was probably more discovered than created. And that discovery mm. happened all around the world, independently. I'd imagine that's probably a very common thing with things that are fermented. I, I, I don't think people... Uh, I, people must have just stumbled upon fermentation uh, by its nature you're sort of just leaving something alone for a very long time. I understand like that's a massive oversimplification, but you can sort of abstractly see how somebody could just accidentally make beer or accidentally make wine. Wine, I, I thought wine came first because 
it, you, you just you just gotta leave your grapes out too long, <laughs> and then it then it slowly starts to poison you. So far back that we have no idea when it first came into being. See, beer not only predates writing, it also predates pottery, domesticated grain, and possibly even settled villages and organized domesticated grain too. To the point of being primordial. Good to Lou. Archaeological record via traces of it on a potsherd discovered in what is now Iran. A potsherd that's seven thousand years old. So given how ancient beer is, how, when, and why it came to be requires some speculation. Now, alcohol would have been known to early humans, even in hunter-gatherer societies, because it occurs naturally. Fruit left out too long can naturally ferment and create alcohol. And that fermentation happens when a single-cell fungus called yeast feeds on sugars, producing carbon dioxide mm. and ethanol as waste products. Seriously, forget dogs or cats. Yeast is actually man's best friend. I mean, just look at these little yeasty boys. Aww. I'm drinking uh, kombucha right now. It's uh, fermented tea, I believe. I, I believe that's what it ends up being. So, like, it has sort of a negligible alcohol content. It's not considered like an alcoholic beverage by any means, but similar process. So I, I do drink something that goes through the symbol, a similar process. Cute little bubbly buddies. <coughs> Sorry, Zoe, but it's kind of true. Yes, dogs helped ancient humans with hunting and security, and cats definitely kept the rodents down, and I know you do a wonder on my taxes, but yeast eats carbohydrates and poops out alcohol, an action crucial for making both bread pretty and interesting. Though Neolithic humans didn't understand fermentation or what alcohol was, they knew the important stuff. It was a substance that induced a state of altered consciousness and tasted pretty good. Good enough, at least, to attract elephants and monkeys, who also loved to get smashed on rotting fruit. This fermented fruit is what you know as wine, which we associate with grapes today, but has been historically made with any sweet fruit, from plums to dates, or even the sap of palm trees. Beer, by contrast, comes from fermented grain, which does not appear naturally. And to make it, you need semi-settled agriculture. So, here's how one theory suggests beer came to be. First, hunter-gatherers realized that grains were a steady source of nutrition. If you pulled grains from wild cereals like barley and wheat, then soaked or boiled them in water, they made an oatmeal or thin gruel that was rich in nutrients. Further, this could be added to soups as a thickener. And grain, unlike fruit and meat, could easily be stored for later. Throw a bunch of grain in a basket, and provided it doesn't get wet, it can last years. But you know, lugging around a However, isn't really ideal while chasing a mammoth, so these hunter-gatherers started forming settlements where wild grains were abundant. There, humans learned to make bread 11,000 to 14,000 years ago. Then, at one point or another, some dough was contaminated by yeast, causing it to ferment and rise due to the carbon dioxide forming bubbles. Beer followed a bit later as an offshoot of bread making. And perhaps fittingly, hmm. given beer's reputation as a relaxing drink, the prevailing... That is how I believe a lot of alcoholic beverages have come along, and how a lot of them are popularized in a lot of ways and often it's a byproduct of uh, uh sometimes it's a byproduct of abundance i know there are i i'm trying to think of what it was um oh whiskey duh in the united states whiskey was like a byproduct of and i know whiskey existed afterwards but like i, I think of our I, I learned it through learning about a american history uh farmers kept uh was it whiskey yeah it, it had to be oh yeah because whiskey rebellion <laughs> there we go that's all i needed i need the things to click in my head uh it's something you made when you had sort of an abundance and you weren't always able to get rid of everything uh, so you use what you grow to make some form of alcohol. In theory for this culture, and you have another thing. Discovery involves someone being lazy. The thought goes that a grain store, maybe a basket, was left out in the rain and sprouted. Wild yeast then colonized the mixture. Beer is bread water. Either that is true. Or on purpose, dropped bread into it. Then afterward, someone decided to drink the resulting fermentation and found that it made them pleasantly intoxicated. And presto, the first keg stand, metaphorically. Then it wasn't long until people were making beer on purpose. It appeared on the tabulation accounts of ancient Sumer, and a recently discovered brewery site in China is 5,000 years old. Our first recipe, quoted in this episode's introduction, comes from a hymn to the Sumerian goddess Ninkasi, praising her creation of the drink while telling brewers how to replicate it. It was recorded 3,900 years ago, but is probably older. Yeah, beer was so important, it had its own goddess. Which makes sense, because it was a cornerstone of civilization. Humans in the Fertile Crescent increasingly took up settled agriculture in order to subsist off of bread and beer, a lifestyle that led to larger populations, permanent structures, and irrigation, aka cities. In the 
Where did moonshine come from? Moonshine's an interesting conversation there. I, I don't fully understand what moonshine is. Like, I, I've sort of just taken it for granted. Um, proof. Oh, at least 80% proof. Or 80, 80 degrees? I, I don't know how they do these things. Uh, at least 40% alcohol by volume. Jeez. That sounds like a lot. <laughs> there you go. These settlements, they kept grain in common storehouses overseen by priests. And one theory goes that these grain stores gradually evolved, gaining more religious functions to become the first temples. And writing was invented to catalog their contents. In fat times, the temple would collect the grain, and then in lean times, they would distribute it. And that distribution often came in the form of beer. Indeed, during the construction of the pyramids, beer was one of the main forms of payment. In fact, there's even a theory. I have not tried whiskey. Um, I've never drank before at all. Um, <laughs> uh, I pretended to sip wine at a wedding once because I wanted to fit in, but I didn't really. I, di I didn't like the smell of whatever it was, and I didn't really want it. And this is before I decided, like, I didn't want to drink. Uh. But yeah, that's as close as I ever got pretending at a wedding. It goes, given the ecology of the area, the wine mentioned in the Bible might have been a translation error. And what people were actually drinking was beer. In fact, it was a major selling point for living in cities. Eat bread, divide labor, ride out bad harvests, and drink beer. Heck, even in the Epic of Gilgamesh, which we have a series on and you can watch here, the wild man Enkidu is civilized and turned human by the consumption of bread and beer. Beer had forgot about that part. Complex society and I know the epic of Kilgamesh kind of. See, the problem little. with cities back then is that human waste quickly poisoned nearby water sources, making it a while safe to drink. But the alcohol in beer was sufficient to kill any microbes that affected humans. So beer was not just a pleasure drink, but a necessary technology for urban living. It was also a source of food, since beer back then was thicker than we think of now, more like a gruel or a Guinness. Kidding, kidding. Love my steak in a glass. Calorie dense and filling, it was one of the first things the temple gave out for famine relief. In fact, it was mm. so thick that there were things floating in it, and people drank it through reed straws to filter out the bigger bits. This was all. So, since it's. Yeah, that, that would be beneficial I, during times where. Uh, in times of famine, you, you often lean into grain, because grain. Uh, while it's not the most nutritious thing, it does make you feel full. So, I guess if we're talking about bread water, then yeah, that, that would definitely help during those times. Also done in a communal bowl, starting a trend that would continue until today, where beer was a drink consumed socially in common. A sign of trust, since with everyone drinking beer from the same vessel, there was no chance of poisoning, and along with other drinks from common containers, like coffee, tea, or wine, beer became synonymous with hospitality. Also, ancient people made a range of beer, knowing that if they tinkered with the ingredients, they could get different results. From ancient Egypt, we see records discussing different types and styles of beer with different alcohol strengths. Granted, most beer people drank was short turned around batches that were only 1% alcohol by volume, but there were others left to sit longer to become stronger. Plus, there were flavor additives like honey, spices, and fruit. And though the fermentation process was a mystery, there was an understanding that some prized magical pots, called in records, the pots that make the beer good, simply <laughs> produced better brew even without dropping bread in. This was because yeast had permanently colonized cracks and imperfections in the pots. But to the ancient people, beers... I, I was trying to learn how to make my own kombucha. And when you when you make it, people will like reuse batches of the stuff to make more of it, which apparently makes it better. So I, there, there's something there. I it, uh, apparently it works. Transformation. Never ended up brewing my own kombucha, though. Nobody let me put uh, some uh, yeah. nobody let me put a bowl of tea in their closet and just forget about it for a while like i don't have a space for that unfortunately i can't just do it on the back porch appeared magical especially since it created an altered state when consumed so it's no wonder that it was used in religious rituals and associated with a range of goddesses Oh, yeah, goddess says, because beer was largely made in the household at the same time as baking bread for thousands of years, brewing was primarily a woman's task. 
But further north, in Europe, mm. change was coming, both through the process of making and consuming beer itself, and for the women who controlled production. But until we get to that part of the story next time, please history responsibly. The next episode is called Barbarian Brew. Let's absolutely just jump right into that, because that sounds interesting. Roman historian Tacitus takes a sip of wine as he- I know that guy, scrolls. kind of. He's compiling an ethnographic study of the German tribes, including their drinking customs. To pass an entire day and night in drinking disgraces no one, he says to the scribe he's dictating to. I feel like I need to drink to this. As it might be expected with intoxicated people are seldom fought with mere abuse, but commonly with wounds and bloodshed. Yet it is at their feasts that they consult on the reconciliation of enemies, matrimonial alliances, choosing chiefs, and even on peace and war. For they think at- Pennsylvania has so many beer laws, it's confusing. That's always interesting uh, to talk about with different people from the United States, because there's a lot of different laws regarding the consumption of alcohol. Well, the distribution of alcohol more throughout the United States and how it's done. Uh, up here, you can't get alcohol from a grocery store, which is something that you can do plenty of places. Uh, in, in plenty of states, you can go to convenience stores and pull an alcoholic beverage out of the fridge aisle thing. And uh, here you can't do that. You have to go to like a specific liquor store. So depending on where you are, the, the laws are different like all over the place there are some places where they have like drive through uh liquor stores basically where you can <laughs> which on the face of it sounds really silly but you can like drive through and pick up pick up your uh your bev and head on home uh, you, you don't even have to leave your car which i've never seen such a thing but i've I heard about it no time is the mind more open to simplicity of purpose or more warmed to noble aspirations. After a digression, he describes their particular alcohol. A liquor for drinking is made out of barley or other grains, which once rotted has a certain resemblance to wine. Ugh, revolting barbarians, he thinks, as he takes mm. another sip of his fermented grapes. Well, <laughs> so beer has like even to this day it's considered to have much less uh uh status it implied status to it, it like it, it's it's a commoner's drink e even now uh even though wine you can get wine pretty cheaply as well i'm pretty sure and it, it I, I don't know why it's still sort of got that i i guess it's just built into the reputation at this point that beer is a commoner's thing wine is for slightly more classy occasions drive drive through drive brew is what we're going for thanks so much to hellofresh for helping us bring this history to the table beer was the drink of the fertile crescent of egypt and north africa Indeed, the beverage ruled the ancient world until it was conquered by the same enemy that menaced all of Europe, the Romans. The Romans were a wine culture, a drink they considered synonymous with civilization, made from a crop that did well in the Italian environment. From the palaces to the far provinces, to be an ancient Roman was to drink wine, and they exported it everywhere in their burgeoning empire. All other alcohols they labeled as foreign, perhaps the worst slur in Roman culture. The irony, of course, being that wine was imported to Rome from Greece, and they learned much of the cultivation Ooh. from it from Carthage. Heck, even their sneering dismissal of other drinks was, like practically all their gods, inherited from the Greeks. But as the Roman... That... The Romans inherited gods from pretty much everywhere that they conquered, which which is interesting. Uh, no, no, sorry. Was it... Was it the Romans? I, I believe... A, a, a good amount of that ended up happening and i guess it differed but depending on where you were in the in the empire because they would incorporate other gods into their larger canon is the word i'm gonna use um, or sometimes they would take the gods of the people they're conquering and find sort of an equivalent because gods would have different names depending on what culture they came from and they're like this god is actually zeus you know so 
Yeah, they were they were actually very good at incorporating other cultures. Empire pushed north into Europe. Are you a Game of Thrones fan? I've only watched season one and it's been a very long time. It increasingly contacted other drinking traditions. I did play the video game though. What can broadly be called beer. Now, all of the information we have on drinking in Northern and Central Europe at this period comes from Roman sources and archaeological evidence, so there's a lot of gaps. But Roman writers do note that even at the time of the Gallic Wars, the people of Central and Northern Europe were barrel-making cultures who enjoyed a wide variety of drinks. These included ale, ale mixed with honey, types of local wine, and mead, which is made from fermented honey rather than grain. But most importantly, they make it very clear that to the Romans, all types of ale were absolutely gross. Beer was generally made from barley, a grain they mostly fed to horses, i.e. literal animal feed. In Rome, barley is what you ate during famine, and they even punished military units by making them live on barley. So when they saw people creating a barley mash, letting it rot in a wooden barrel, and then drinking it, blah, that was a double yuck. Though just FYI, this rotting was the same process of fermentation that produced their precious wine, so glass houses and all that. Some tribes, like the Gauls, who inhabited what is now France, took to Roman wine and even began cultivating it themselves, while others were more resistant. In his Gallic War, Caesar wrote that the toughest- Of course the French, uh, the proto-French, we'll say, embraced r wine right off the bat. Yeah, the Telltale game. Uh, have you ever seen the Town Sentence series on the 18th century cooking? He brews a lot of beer. I, I have not, I'm not familiar and wildest tribes were the Germans, and in particular the Belgians, who both refused Rome's drink. They do not at all allow wine to be imported among them, he wrote, since they believe that by it men are made soft and effeminate for the endurance of hardship. And Caesar agreed, believing that wine drinking had weakened the Gauls and assisted Rome's civilized conquest. Now, Caesar never mentioned beer at all, but later Roman authors expanded on this idea of beer making barbarians wild and strong with the comforts of civilization, particularly wine, enfeebling them. At the same time, the rulers of the tribes who came under the Roman banner started drinking wine, making it associated with higher status, and do you detect a stereotype forming here? Wine, the drink of the civilized and powerful, of educated city dwellers, one that tames wild men but makes them effeminate and weak, and beer. A common man's brew that makes drinkers strong and wild, courageous and quarrel prone. And it lasts to this day. Civilization lacks. And like it or not, those ideas are still with us today. It should yeah. be, known, however, that Roman troops did gradually start drinking beer, especially in the far flung posts like Britain when wine wasn't available. And that's kind of how things stood with wine as the dominant drink. What do you drink? Whatever you got. Like, it's that sort of thing. Like, you, you, you drink. What do you drink? What's there? Until the Western Roman Empire fell and the transport networks for wine crumbled. So what are people drinking after Rome's collapse, you ask? Well, in places like Normandy and Bordeaux that produced wine grapes, still wine. But outside those areas, mead was now the most important beverage of the elite, particularly in Germany Ooh, mead. and Britain. There, mead halls were an important part of culture, a communal spot for socializing, swearing oaths, and conducting business. Now, we could spend an entire episode on mead halls and their social political functions, but right now, I want you to look at its architecture, with its large open spaces, benches, and long tables. What does that look like to you? Yep, it's a beer hall, the kind largely associated today. I don't have a preference between beer or wine because I don't drink, but, you know. Ooh, Ethan's right, cider. I prefer cider. Though I, I prefer mine non-alcoholic, but I'd imagine like if I did drink, I'd want something yummy and fruity like like a cider. Stay with Germany, and if you're in my neck of the woods, Astoria. What up, Bohemian Hall? Sorry, back on track. Though spurned by the powerful, ale had never gone fully out of fashion with average households. It was too useful and easy to make, and they hey, the preferred- Sorry, I didn't catch you a second ago. In Germany, it held on tenaciously, and in Ireland, which the Romans decided not to mess with, beer was never interrupted at all. Now, the idea that medieval people drank beer due to water being unsafe is mostly a myth. The Middle Ages not being ancient Sumer, after all, and fresh supplies of clean water were abundant even in cities. But ale was considered more pleasurable, hearty, and hospitable. A young monk spoke for most Europeans when he observed that he drank, quote, ale if I can get it, and water if I have no ale, unquote. <laughs> By the year 1000, ale was also... That, that's such a, like, hashtag casual alcoholic thing. <laughs> that's just like we we make jokes like that now about casual alcoholism and it's sort of a tragic thing in that sense but like they've been making these jokes 
since ever. <laughs> to become commercial, monks brewed it for the poor. Or they didn't think of it like that, but still. Ale was also considered a type of liquid bread, meaning it could be drunk for sustenance during fast days when the monks were only supposed to consume bread and water. However, women still did the vast majority of brewing. They brewed for the household and sold or exchanged whatever they had left over. Sometimes neighbors took turns in a goods exchange, with one neighbor brewing one week and the other the next. Inevitably, some women were better at it than others and began to open the front rooms of their homes as businesses. When the beer was ready, this alewife- Hell yeah, get paid, girl! Outside to signal that they were open for business. Then neighbors would come to either fill their buckets to take back home or bring cups to consume beer on the premises. These homes, dubbed alehouses in England, were the first type of public house. And soon, they were joined by taverns, which also sold wine and offered private rooms for the wealthy, and inns that offered food. Oh, that came first? That's crazy to me that that came before, like, even, like, a tavern or an inn. That, that's given me a little bit of perspective there. Overnight accommodation, stables, and often financially incentivized company in the rooms upstairs. The ale they served was porridge-like, full of spice and berry flavorings, and mostly the low-alcohol small beer. People drank 10 liters of it a day. By the reign of Henry III in the 13th century, the trade was big enough to attract regulation. As part of a law called the Assize of Bread and Ale, the first food and drink quality legislation in Britain, local officials called ale tasters would tour establishments every six weeks, doing the very hard demanding work of ensuring the ale being sold was of sufficient quality, fairly priced, and had its strength labeled. Ooh, that sounds like a tough job, Zoe, but someone had to do it. You know, preferably someone who gave their brother-in-law the mayor a nice fat purse right before their appointment. Ah, delicious, delicious corruption. But on the continent, a new innovation would change beer forever. Because in Germany, people were adding hops to ale in order to give it a more complex, bitter, smoky flavor and also preserve it. This also, by mm. some definitions, turned ale into true beer. Now, sometimes it's been said that the polymath abbess Hildegard von Bingen was the first to hop ale, creating what we now know as beer. And while it's possible she did some experiments with that, you know, between running a convent, writing poetry and play. So we're basically saying that beer is subjective. That yeah, like we're not like when does it become another thing entirely is <laughs> receiving visions from god practicing medicine drafting works of philosophy and science creating her own language and being the most prolific musical composer of the middle ages people had been experimenting for centuries before her birth so you know maybe we can't chuck this one up to her and hops changed everything taste wise sure but also when it came to production hopped beer lasted weeks meaning for the first time beer could be made in large quantities and exported as commercial product importantly far across the sea oh so that's what matters with us next week as we form guilds swig with martin luther and ask the pressing question is getting oh. a sin and oh that's exciting i i assume we're gonna like wrap up with like temperance or something like that right I mean, the United States, our relationship with... I, I, maybe there's something more contemporary than even that, but I, I, I think plenty of people think about prohibition and how that massively impacted the game. But would that be too obvious? Would that not be adding something like new and unique to the conversation? I, I don't know. But like the temperance moving le movement leading up to prohibition, there, there's a conversation to be had here. But that's also the larger conversation of alcohol and not just beer. And maybe they just want to stay just narrow enough on beer. They must find a way to be able to mention it, though. I would think. And while you pop, we'll see. Germany, 1539. The table at Martin Luther's home seats 50 people, and nearly every seat is full. He's in fine form tonight. He calls the Pope the Antichrist, refers to the church as a brothel, and as he does about the noxious farts previous popes have let off. Real rebellious talk. As he speaks, his wife, Katharina, a former nun, fills his stein. She makes the beer herself, thousands of liters a year, in the Luther's personal brewery. And it's good, lubricating these table sessions. I'm trying to think. What would they have used against consumption of alcohol? Um, I'm trying to think of like what, what Bible verse you're going to. I, I mean, there, there's always, you can always default to like my body is a temple. Well, I, I, I know that's not exactly how it's intended. Plenty of people have used that to say there's a lot of things you shouldn't do. So I don't know. I guess we'll see. Plus the beer is hopped. 
itself an act of rebellion, as hops currently are an untaxed weed, different from the spice mix the Catholic monks use in their brewing. As Luther continues, one listener takes notes and will publish these remarks in a book called Table Talk. Others will create beer steins showing the Pope as the Antichrist. It would seem that Catholicism's monopoly on Christianity and brewing is falling apart over Katharina's fine beer. Dude, this is cool. This is... Isn't this so much better than talking about war? Honestly, this is... This is the history I care about. And it, you know what? Even though we're getting into the elite here, Learning about stuff like this teaches you more about ordinary people than war does often. Occasionally, when you talk about war, you get the fun opportunity to learn about the ordinary soldier. But a lot of the time, people just like to focus on like the big decision makers and the little soldiers are just, uh, eh. Yeah, they're, just, they're there. Thanks so much to Curiosity Stream for helping us brew up today's historical tale. When we left off, alehouses, taverns, and inns had come on the scene. And just as important, people had started hopping ale, a method that properly turned the beverage into beer, creating a more complex tasting product that could be made in larger batches without spoiling, shipped, and to a certain extent, even branded. Indeed, hops was the first true step in turning beer into a viable commercial product. And as the 14th and 15th centuries wound on, certain breweries started becoming famous for their beer. One major center of brewing was Munich, where the Augustina Brewery, run initially by Augustinian monks, formed in 1328. Soon, they were experimenting with a new type of strong beer known as Bach. Much as France was already <sighs> famous in the medieval era for its wine, Munich became known for its quality beer, a reputation they tried to protect by passing a beer purity law in 1516, declaring that the only ingredients in beer could be water, barley, and hops, yeast being considered part of the production rather than an ingredient. While this was not the first that's like a weird overstep. Like I understand. Uh, like when you try to regulate the, I don't know, you're, we, we regulate food and stuff all the time. Like it's gotta be safe or whatever, but to regulate it as like in like a purity thing, like, like independent, of the health quality of it that, that that's that's some silly stuff right here uh we we don't typically i i don't think we typically think of the issues like that anymore at least i can't think of an example a recent example of something like that not being laughed out of the room to be a quality law in the holy roman empire nor did it apply outside of bavaria it was a masterful exercise in branding declaring to the european market that munich cared about its beer not everyone, though, was so excited about hops. The English in particular considered hopped beer repulsive and unhealthy, a drink for foreigners, while unhopped, top-fermented ale was best for them. Even Shakespeare weighed in, having his heroes drink ale, not beer. And no wonder, for his father was an official ale taster. Oh, hell yeah. Becoming more common in England. By 1574, his dad had a good gig. London brewers had switched to hopped beer, leading to a competition between the two drinks. Unable to compete on longevity or its array of flavors, English ale brewers began tinkering to increase the amount of alcohol. London's beer brewers retaliated until England was awash in high-proof mixes, given hyperbolic names like Dragon's Milk, and English beer became thus known as both powerful and coming in a huge variety of flavors. In fact, the English market was huge, with a large number of independent brewers. This was partially because when Henry VIII dissolved the monasteries, their brewing operations got turned over to laymen, creating a thriving professional industry large and respectable enough to form guilds. But not everyone oh, cool. happy about it. Sorry, airplane's about to go overhead. Um, so it w one could say that it's become more of a free market, I suppose, than it was before. Well, if it was limited, the the monasteries it, it would have they would have had a monopoly over it so now this is like uh and it's also taking it from groups that are considered more on the elite side like religious leaders are like while they're a different kind of elite they are a form of elite so this is giving it back to i don't know if it's necessarily ordinary people who would have the resources to start up this business but back to the people in in a way for something like seven millennia, Brewsters, female brewers, weren't just at the center of beer manufacturing, they were beer manufacturing. And provided they only sold to neighbors, it stayed that way. 
But when beer became a fully-fledged industry, women could no longer participate. To do that, they would have to hire and manage a staff, participate in guilds, travel away from the home to ship goods, and represent the brewery and sign contracts. All things women at the time were barred from doing. Still, a few did. Largely widows who showed up at guild meetings on behalf of their family until children came of age, yet that became less common over time. Women were still part of the cycle, but now they were the ones serving the beer, not making it. Meanwhile, another group was starting to worry about the effects of all this brewing, the leaders of church and state. At first, their concerns were centered around taverns. In 1400, when Chaucer set his Canterbury Tales in a tavern, a I know Chaucer, could rub kind of. With a miller, nuns, a partner, and a wife of Bath, he was reflecting the reality of his time. Taverns were a secular space where, by tradition, class distinctions were set aside and people could speak freely. This not only made it a congregating space to rival that of churches, and clerics often complained of people being on a bench in a tavern rather than on their knees in a chapel, it also was a- Yeah, that, that, that's what I was saying. Like, this is, it's kind of a, uh, you're, you're sort of democratizing it. You're giving it back to ordinary people and, and you're taking control out of the, the hands of the religious elite. That's, that, that's, that's pretty rad, <laughs> I gotta say. Like, beer, beer did an interesting thing here. Political center. One that could be used to criticize the crown or engage in sedition, especially because with enough beer, things just kind of slip out. Like Martin Luther at his table or the gunpowder plot hatched in a series of London taverns. So oh, shoot. they weren't really off the mark on that sedition thing. But there wasn't really much they could do. Beer was a staple of life, and by Elizabeth's time, London had a public house for every 125 residents, meaning this boozy genie was well out of the bottle. Leaders also increasingly worried about drunkenness, a social ill that became more concerning as European society professionalized and became more advanced. See, here's the thing about medieval peasants. They didn't do a lot, like they had to plant one season, harvest another, keep animals, and get to church. And that was kind of it. They even had a lot of religious holidays, meaning that if some were drunk here and there, it wasn't that big an issue. But then society started developing more specialist artisan trades, ones with business dealings, where they had to fulfill contracts and be places on time, meaning being drunk became a bit more detrimental. Some of the mm. concerns around problem drinking centered around young students. I'm surprised we got three episodes in before this became an issue. I honestly thought they would have... And I, I feel like the first two episodes really didn't talk very much at all about like the social consequences of widespread drinking. So like it, it, it's actually pretty interesting. We're halfway through the series basically at this point, halfway through the third episode out of five. And we're just now talking about people being drunk and disorderly. That's kind of crazy that it took that long. At 13th century universities who were infamous for imbibing mass quantities of wine and terrorizing the residents of the town. In both Oxford and Paris, arguments over tavern bills broke into deadly rioting. In Paris, it led to a two-year student strike after authorities killed several scholars, and after the townspeople of Oxford finally had enough, formed mobs, and hung a few students, a group of faculty and scholars fled and formed a new university. They called it Cambridge. However, one part of the world had already acted on this problem. In the 7th century, after a series of incidents among his followers, the Prophet Muhammad had decided to outright ban Muslims drinking alcohol. Oh. He wasn't exactly into that. Not only did Jesus drink wine in the Bible, one of his signature miracles was turning water into wine. Plus, in the Catholic Church, wine is a sacred part of communion, and lots of monasteries made money for the church and the poor by brewing. On the Protestant side, they'd been instrumental in spreading the adoption of hops. Again, a substance that was not taxed and different from the blend of spices monks used. And while he did lament the drunkenness beer brought at times, Luther himself loved a good brew, particularly if it was made with medicinal spices to help his constipation. In so M Muhammad was very direct about it. I I've not read the Quran. I, I've read a good chunk of the Bible, I would say, but I'm not. I'm only familiar with like Islam as far as like it's come up in conversation rather than reading from source here. So knowing that Muhammad sort of made the call because drunk and disorderly behavior kind of plagued him at the time. And now that sort of plagued his people at the time. And now that carries on as sort of a tradition to this day is rather interesting. It, it's sort of like the right point in time for something to be ingrained in a culture for all coming time, which is absolutely crazy. 
other words, beer had become an institution, a substance so important to European life, finance, and culture, it could not be acted against. So, it was informally agreed upon that instead of banning the substance itself, civil and church leaders would essentially tell people not to go overboard. Instead, more scorn was heaped on the newly created distilled spirits discovered by alchemists, originally sold in single shots. Alchemists! Oh my god, we still have alchemists! There was, however, an outlier. One Anabaptist reformer dared to call on fellow Christians to abstain from even beer and wine. Drinking, he argued, inevitably led to sin. His fellow Protestants promptly beheaded him. But the 16th and 17th centuries were not only the era of Reformation, they were also the era of exploration. As the Spanish conquered Central and South America and the Portuguese went to Asia, they also discovered new worlds of alcohol. Oh, God. They found the Incas making maize beer. The Aztecs, meanwhile, fermented agave sap into a cloudy beer-like concoction, which, once distilled with European technology, became mezcal and tequila. In China and Japan, Tequila! Rice I know that one. <laughs> they found drinks made from fruit, tree bark, and palm sap. But when the English landed in North America, they contacted a people who, while they fermented alcohol out of mesquite pods and maple sap depending on their region, had not encountered stronger grain-based alcohols. The settlers decided to change that. So join us next time as we enter the age of revolution. Where Fermenting revolution. Oh my god, that's a great name for an episode. Let's see it. Dragon Tavern, Boston, 1768. The Sons of Liberty have gathered to lift tankards in solidarity. They do so surrounding a silver bowl filled with rum punch, made by one of their members, Paul Revere. Another among them is a malter named Samuel Adams, who- Samuel Adams, it's, it's, it's ironic that we're talking- Is it ironic? That's may, maybe not the right word. It's interesting that we're talking about a guy who, uh, probably today is more well known for being the face of a rather popular beer. Produces the cerealized mixture sold to brewers to make beer. And across from him is John Hancock, a merchant specializing in importing Spanish wine. They swill American beer and rum, talking about how new British laws have impacted their lives. The Sugar Act squeezed the rum business. Trade restrictions kept the colonists from selling their products, including alcohol, abroad. And now they have to quarter British soldiers in their homes, barns, and stables, and were legally required to give them five pints of beer a day. In retaliation, Boston brewers have instituted a boycott, refusing to buy British malt. The colonies are drinking their way toward revolution. Future alcoholic beverage Samuel Adams. Man, I, I, I wish I was funny enough to phrase it like that. Thanks so much to HelloFresh for helping us bring this history to the table. By the 18th century, Europe was barreling toward revolution, and the Green Dragon Tavern was not alone as a center for dissent. During both the American and French revolutions, rebels organized themselves around taverns and other drinking establishments, and later beer halls would serve a similar role in the revolutions of 1848. But another revolution was taking place at the same time, one centered on the process of making beer. See, for most of history, beer had little competition. Apart from grape-producing regions where wine was cheap enough for common people to enjoy, there just wasn't another commercial beverage that could compete with it. But now, there were tons, with the increasing global trade network bringing more options. Oh no, not beer! Ethiopia, ...and that you can learn more about in our Protect history. beer! ...here had made its way through Europe. Not to mention, tea had arrived on the scene from China, and Europe had even gotten a taste for the Aztec practice of drinking chocolate. But the biggest rival of beer was distilled Ooh. spirits, which began circulating in the 13th century as medicine, and named with nebulous terms like strong waters or aqua vitae. And a few centuries of experimentation meant that by the 18th century, brandy- And spicy water, as uh, good old Danhausen refers to it. Rum, gin, and whiskey were not only commercially viable products, but increasingly tasted way better than years prior. So if you wanted to get drunk, and no ifs, ands, or buts about it, the early modern Europeans most assuredly did, spirits got the job done a lot faster and at a lower cost, though with a lot more danger as well. During the gin craze of the 18th century, London started seeing a level of drunkenness it had never experienced before. People were dying of alcohol poisoning, a thing almost impossible to do with lower strength beers common at the time. Drunk Londoners were dying in gory accidents, losing their businesses, and even selling their or their children's clothes to buy gin. And while this created a moral panic about drunkenness in the lower classes, and it's always about the lower classes, I mean, members of parliament were actually admired for their ability to give speeches while drunk, this moral outcry also provided cover for beer. In contrast, beer was seen as wholesome, even healthy. In 1751, English artist William Hogarth published The Prince, Beer Street, and Gin Lane to make an explicit side-by-side -side comparison. Jeez. Yeah, this is definitely like 
a classist thing we've got going on here. And Jin Lane to make an explicit side-by-side -side comparison. On Jin Lane, the people are dying skeletal zombies. A carpenter pawns his tools as buildings fall apart while violence and crime are- Wait, wait a minute. Oh, Beer Street is the good one. Huh. To okay. Make an explicit side-by-side -side comparison. On Jin Sorry, I wasn't following well. Are dying skeletal zombies. A carpenter pawns his tools as buildings fall apart while Oh, Jin's the strong stuff, duh. Meanwhile, over on Beer Street, the only one going out of business is the pawnbroker. Everyone is rotund, happy, prosperous, patriotic, and glowing with health and virality. And not only was beer supposedly healthy, it was entering a new era of innovation. Large brewers were starting to produce it in larger volumes, and new types of beer popped up all over Europe. Crucially, these were not created using additives, but rather by innovations in the process of fermentation. In the 1760s, a new series of technologies appeared that meant beer could be produced with greater consistency and control. Steam engines made large-scale factories easier to manage. Thermometers and hydrometers meant beer could be monitored for temperature and consistency while brewing. And the drum roaster, created in 1817, sealed out the smoky flavor malts acquired by roasting directly over wood, straw, or a coal concentrate called coke. Who the hell drinks malt, da, da, malt liquor anymore? In the 1720s, London brewers were selling a new brew called Porter, a name that supposedly arose because it was popular among the porters that carried loads on the streets and docks. Made with a dark malt and heavily hopped, it was delicious, cheap, and lasted for months. Porter beer traveled all over Europe, but it was in Ireland where it made its biggest impact. There, breweries began making it particularly strong, or... And it took us, uh... Three and a half episodes to mention Ireland, I believe. If this is the first mention of it. Just, just pointing this out. Extra stout in the language of the time. And Irish brewers often used malt that had been cooked until it was crisped, giving the thick beer. Maybe it was mentioned black. earlier, I don't remember. And brewer became so famous for it. His name has become forever linked with the drink. Arthur Guinness. The oh, Arthur shoot, Guinness what up? I know that. Great, who That's a drink. ...be supplied with the best English beer. Supposedly, English sailors found that beer shipped to Russia tended to freeze, and in response, developed a brew with a high enough alcohol content to prevent ice from forming. Thus, the story goes, Russian imperial stout was born. Oh! That wasn't the only is that, like, culture? Uh, like, Russia collectively has a drinking problem, is the stereotype. Uh... So, I... <laughs> that's... So is, is, is this like the beginning? Is is it just like a geographic problem that caused that to be a problem that they, that carries on sort of to this day? At least I, I think there's still like, they, they have a reputation for being heavy drinkers. They, they're kind of up there with Ireland. Uh, whether or not it's like, it lives up to the stereotype, I don't Probably, but I don't know. Sleep beer created by a sea voyage. Pale Ales, a golden or vodka, had arrived around the same time as Porter. It's a beer the East India Company was interested in, given that Porter was too heavy for company officials and troops serving in the heat of the subcontinent. So they went to a brewer named George Hodgson, who was just up the river from their docks. After experimenting with other beers, he tried making a well-known brew called October Ale. This was a heavily hopped autumn beer that was supposed to mature in the cask for a year before being bottled to mature for another year. But Hodgson got extremely lucky. The conditions of heat and agitation on the four-month journey to India sped up the maturation process, and it arrived ready to drink. And though his sons went on to lose the contract, a rival brewery recreated the formula, which by then was already known as India Pale Ale. Yet beer innovation was not the sole province of the English. Most German beers had traditionally been lager, a name derived from a process called lagering, which meant letting them ferment in basements under relatively low temperature. One type, hmm. Doppelbach, was even left out to freeze in winter and the ice discarded in order to concentrate it. These beers were often dark and sweet, but that was changing. Russian men could probably increase their life expectancy a decade if not for vodka. <laughs> oh god, that, that's tragic if that's true. <laughs> that, that is genuinely uh tragic thought in the early 1930s gabriel siedemeyer of the spaten brewery in munich traveled europe in hopes of learning how to modernize the german brewing industry supposedly he even engaged in industrial espionage stealing malt hops and beer samples from the british breweries and hiding them in a cane when he returned he adopted thermometers installed the first brewery steam engine in germany and tried making a pale ale with the process of lagering thereby inventing pale lager Another Bavarian brewer, Josef Grohl, decided to iterate on pale lager at his own brewery in Pilsen, in what is now the Czech Republic. That resulting beer would be named after his city, Pilsner. This pale lager, or Pilsner, some use them interchangeably, exploded. 
Light and refreshing. It was the perfect type of drink for warmer climates. Bavarian brewers then took it to the United States, where it became... This is moving a lot faster. German immigrants also took it to Mexico, where most beers are still lagers, and garnished it with local touches like lime, salt, and chili powder. Now, trust me, Rob and I could go on like this for hours, and we have in private meetings, but you get the point. By the mid-19th century, there were more beers available than ever before, and in greater quantities. And breweries were no longer at-home operations, but large industrial factories. For example, in 1814, a series of rusting tank rings at a brewery in London gave way, flooding the district with beer, wiping out multiple buildings, and- I heard about this. Yeah, that's how much beer they were making. Enough to cause a natural disaster. But a happier thing happened a few years earlier in 1810. A wedding. On a fine October day, Crown Prince Ludwig married Princess Therese on a meadow outside Munich. They held a parade and days of horse racing, with beer of course present in abundance. It was so fun that they decided to do it again the next year, and the year after that, and the year after that. In fact, apart from cancellations due to wars and epidemics, it's been held every year since, both in Munich and in German communities all over the world. You probably know it as Oktoberfest, and I've been to a few. But German immigrants would carry more than drinking festivals abroad. So join us next time as humanity finally discovers yeast. The temperance movement leads to a crusade against alcohol. And a German immigrant, fresh out of the Union Army, creates the largest beer company in the world. Aww. So, we're ta so we are going to definitely talk about temperance. I don't know if we're going to talk about uh, prohibition. But we'll see. Now, sorry, we're, before we we're definitely going into temperance. Paris, 1876. Which is cool. Louis Pasteur is one of the greatest scientific minds in Europe, and he's turned his attention toward two things. Beer. The temperance movement is very interesting because it was largely led by women, which is a very interesting way in which a lot of women for the first time started stepping into the political sphere, at least in the United States. Uh, they really, uh, I, I use the term activated a lot of women politically. I, I consider us all political beings, whether we participate in politics or not, but sometimes we'll have moments and or issues that occur to us and they just sort of wake us up and we start to realize our political role. And some people never quite are politically activated, but uh, I sort of, I sort of think of it in that terms like I've I've lived long enough to see my dad, who is like not a very uh, politically active person, like find politics very suddenly. It was like, oh, that that activated. I I, I saw him activated politically. Uh, I was activated politically like in sixth grade or something, and I couldn't get enough of politics. And that's this is just the uh, the issue that activated a lot of women at the time and vengeance. 16 years earlier, he'd unlocked a millennia old secret by proving that yeast, in the absence of oxygen, is what ferments sugar into alcohol. And then he thought he was done with beer until the war, the Franco-Prussian War, where France lost its hops growing region of Alsace-Lorraine. For French pride, for French beer, he must again delve into the secrets of brewing in order to create what he calls a beer of national revenge. What he discovers this time are these specific microorganisms that make beer spoil or go sour. And he finds oh. that bringing it to near boiling, pasteurizing it like with milk, will kill these organisms and increase the beer's stability and shelf life. Though this discovery will not remain French, it will inaugurate a new era, the age of scientific beer. Beer is like such a science, isn't it? It... I, I always think of it like, I think it's a lot like baking. I, I Cooking is an art, baking is a science. And I think uh, sort of beer brewing and fermenting and that, that sort of process, it kind of falls under a similar category of, uh, of science as like, as like baking. It's, it's such a, a, I would say a precise process and in a lot of ways varied. Thanks so much to Brilliant for helping us ferment this historic tale. When we left off, beer was going global, and industrialization was about to turn regional breweries into the massive beverage corporations we know today. Troops in British India, previously sickened in large numbers by local drinks, were now sipping on IPAs brewed in the UK. Viennese-style Pilsner was being produced in IPA. Mexico, and the twin forces of trade and colonialism were- I, I didn't really know what an IPA was. I thought that was a more recent concept because I only recently started like 
the last five years or so started hearing the term IPA, but I think they just sort of became a little bit more fash fashionable again or something. It, I, I don't think it's anything extraordinary about it, but it, it was sort of a new term to me, not all that long ago in the grand scheme of things. For bringing European beer to foreign shores and founding some of the largest breweries of the modern era. In 1869, a Norwegian-American opened a brewery in Yokohama, which would eventually become Kirin. Seven years later, the Meiji government founded Sapporo Brewery, and what would become Asahe followed in 1889. China had an active beer brewing culture for thousands of years, but when grains like millet fell out of the diet, brewing shifted to rice. Yet as European powers carved out pieces of the Qing dynasty in the 19th century, foreigners began re-establishing Chinese beer. Poles, Germans, and Czechs started breweries in Haben, but it was in one particular city that a joint English-German concern found success when it founded a brewery in Qingdao in 1903. Today, China is the world's largest beer consumer, and Qingdao is the second most popular brew in China, surpassed only by snow beer, which traces its origins to a brewery established by Karen in 1936 in what was mm. Japan's Manchurian puppet state. But things were brewing back in Europe, too, specifically Northern Europe. In 1847, a young Danish man named J.C. Jacobson founded a brewery outside Copenhagen, using steam power and other new industrial technologies to produce Danish Pilsner. With his eye on the future, he named it after his five-year-old son, Carl. Thus, Carlsberg was born. 17 years later, it gained some competition when a 22-year-old bought an outdated 16th century brewery in Amsterdam, determined to modernize it. He hired a student of Louis Pasteur to find and culture new types of bottom fermenting yeast, and he christened both the brewery and his beer with his own name, Heineken. Together okay, there we go. I was waiting for one to actually come up that I knew. I'm like, I know I'm supposed to know these, but I didn't know those last couple. Here, there, there's one, I know Heineken. These rivals kickstarted the scientific age of brewing. Both Carlsberg and Heineken approached beer like a research project, establishing in-house laboratories where scientists experimented with new techniques, equipment, and ingredients. Beer got clearer and more carbonated. Meanwhile, the area that would become Germany was going Carbonation. to be It would have major echoes far across the Atlantic in America. Now, we know we haven't talked much about the United States in this series. Partially, it's because for thousands of years, it didn't exist. Amazing, I know. But it's also because, well, American beer was just sort of fine. Sure, it was always there yeah. and often affecting history. For example, the Mayflower landed at Plymouth Rock because it ran out of beer and taxes on brewers helped fund Washington's army. But America's drink was whiskey, which was made easily from barley and corn, lasted longer, was easier to transport, and had a higher exchange value with the young country's largest trade partner, Native American tribes. In fact, colonial mm. Americans drank only a third of the beer modern Americans do, and much less than their British cousins at the time. In fact, as an apprentice in London... People always make it out like it, people were drinking constantly back then. So that's sort of a... That's sort of a surprise in how much that puts things into perspective. They always make it out like they drank more beer than water. I guess today, people don't drink a whole lot of water. They're usually drinking other sorts of things. Benjamin Franklin was scandalized by how much his British colleagues consumed. Until the 1840s, most U.S. beer was produced in the Northeast and consisted of English style. Americans were kind of prude sometimes too. Economic freedom did make for mediocre brew. While most European countries had high standards for licensing breweries and quality control legislation, none of that existed in the United States. Beer was a product, not an art. But a revolution was coming, specifically the revolutions of 1848, a largely failed series of liberal uprisings which convinced a whole generation of young, largely middle-class Germans to immigrate to the United States and take their brewing knowledge with them. But when they arrived, they found the older German communities on the East Coast too crowded, especially for brewing. So instead, they struck out for the newly founded cities in the Midwest, where the land was literally free, cereals and hops grew easily, and the cold winters meant ice for lagering beer was abundant. There, they founded large and expanding lager breweries and brought the German drinking culture of beer gardens with their friendly, visible, and community-oriented intoxication to America. In 1855, Swabian immigrant Friedrich Müller arrived in Milwaukee, Wisconsin Müller. and purchased an existing brewery to... I know I've heard a lot of people with that name. Americanized name, Miller. Oh! Year, Schlitz arrived in the city and married a brewer's widow, taking over the business and naming it after himself. But then when the Great Fire of 1871 destroyed Chicago, torching most uh. of the rival breweries, he donated beer to get the city through, earning his brew the nickname, the beer that made Milwaukee famous. And then there was Frederick Pabst, who took ownership of his father-in-law's brew. Pabst! Blue Ribbon! Okay, I, I knew this one ahead of time. ...and decided, as a branding exercise, to tie a blue ribbon around the bottles of the... Yeah! For his father I know things. That's right. 
best beer with a blue ribbon around it. And though Paps Blue Ribbon had never actually won any awards, well, he just never corrected anyone who assumed it had. Miller, Schlitz, and Paps, collectively known as the Beer Barons, became hugely wealthy, building enormous mansions and funneling their money into everything from resorts to some of the country's first amusement parks. But while they, oh, came, shoot. they what also up? banded together, during the Civil War, when Lincoln rolled out new taxes to pay for the conflict, they convinced him that clean, well-made, and healthy German lager should pay only 60% of the taxes that other beers did, giving them a major competitive advantage. But even so, all of them were about to be usurped. Adolphus Bush exited the Civil War both as a corporal in the Union Army and newly married to the daughter of St. Louis. But Adolphus Bush, okay, what, what did he do? I'm trying to think of, I'm trying to decide what company is Adolphus Bush. Man, I'm, I'm not gonna get it. Brewery owner Eberhard Anheuser. During the war, where 200,000 Germans served in the U.S. Army, Budweiser observed the popularity of lager beer amongst the ranks. I'm guessing when Budweiser. Way into the Anheuser Busch Brewery, he used every modern technology he could. Oh, from Anheuser Busch. Is that a, is that a thing in itself? Is that already a thing? That might be a thing. That actually does sound like it's a thing. On winter ice I don't know beer. Year round, to pasteurization that killed the microbes in beer, to industrial bottling machines, to refrigerated rail cars that shipped his product countrywide. Yeah, that's our. That's already a thing. Never mind. For me. Like ashtrays to bars and convincing them to stock only his signature beer, a beer inspired by the brews <gasps> from the Czech town. No. Budweiser, or as we of course know it, Budweiser. Oh, I was right. Oh shoot! What up? <laughs> Oh, Anheuser Busch is like the, 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 the umbrella term, but Budweiser's the thing. Okay, yeah, I did get it. Beers in the Midwest, and America usurped Germany as the largest beer producer in the world. Anheuser Busch was well on its way to becoming the planet's largest brewing company. Yet trouble was coming. See, for decades, concerns had been rising about America's drinking problem, and beer, which often flew under the radar, landed in the crosshairs. Because the largely white, Protestant, long-established families, who tended to favor temperance, often... No, they make Budweiser, but that's the company. Still, I still feel sufficiently, uh, uh, sufficiently correct. I, I'm correct enough to be proud. I'm close enough. Let me have this, please. As immigrant drinks. The Irish with their whiskey, Italians with their wine, and especially after World War I, these German types. I guess what he made. Gained from an empire of drunkenness. And that wave of anti immigrant panic helped sweep prohibition into law in 1920. Ironically, though, prohibition ultimately proved good for the big breweries. See, they weathered the storm by producing soft drinks while smaller brewers perished. And by killing the competition, it left the macro breweries in a position of dominance that's only changed in the last few decades. And that's how we got to the world we know today. How beer went from something made in Neolithic baskets to a massive product shipped and consumed around the world. But before last call, let's have one final toast across time. Closing like time. Past, whether you're a beer baron, peasant ill. One last Sumerian call Kazi for alcohol. Minuteman, Inca Emperor, whiskey Sherman, or beer. Builder, or scientist. Let's all raise a glass. Closing the time. The gears of human history. Beer. You don't Cheers, have everyone. to go home, but you, know, you can't no stay here. Which got me thinking, maybe I should finally graduate from simply doing my own research in my own lab to taking that chemical reaction or computational biology course gonna, I'm thinking about. Since this is new, I'm gonna let the ad play out. There, there, there's a promo code on screen if anybody's interested in using this or whatever. Or I don't know. You know, one of the things we really love about our EC community is that a lot of us are lifelong learners. People who are super passionate about leveling up our knowledge, but also like doing it on their own schedule. Which is why we think Brilliant, the interactive learning environment focusing on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, you know, the whole STEM set, is perfect for learning at your own pace. Replacing traditional lectures with hands-on interactive lessons, complete with visual examples and a storytelling approach that is super engaging. Case in point, Jeff has been brushing up on his fundamentals, having already worked his way through some foundational computer science courses and is about to jump into some statistics and probability. Whereas I've been really enjoying channeling my inner Mr. Spock and strengthening my analytic muscles with their multi-part courses on logic and deduction. Because I want to be able to role play my next D&D character as more of a Holmes than a Watson if you catch my drift. So if you're a curious I feel you. professional I feel or you. experienced, you can find out more about Brilliant and buff your brain by going to brilliant.org slash extra credits and signing up for free. Ooh, and the first 200 people that go to the link will also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Does the promo, promo code still work? I almost certainly. It's only been a couple months. Maybe it hasn't. I don't know. Turk, Alicia Bramble, Angela Valenciana, Casey Muscha, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blaine, Kyle Murgatroyd, and Orioles One for being fantastic legendary patrons. All right, we will call it there. That was a blast. 
that's what this should be like the that that's that's the extra history i love to see